This session is devoted to metaprograms and in particular to metaprograms related to motivation. So our objectives for this session are that at the end of it you'll be able to describe the motivation metaprograms, elicit the motivation metaprograms and evaluate the use of metaprograms in coaching. Metaprograms were first identified by Richard Bandler in his exploration of unconscious mental programs. This research was continued under the leadership of Leslie Cameron Bandler with the help of others including David Gordon, Robert Diltz and Mary Beth Mayers Anderson. Roger Bailey and Ross Stewart then produced a commercial profiling tool based on metaprograms called the Language and Behaviour Profile or as it's commonly called the lab profile. And in 1997, Shelley Rose Charvet further developed the research and produced her book, The Words That Change Minds. So what are metaprograms? They are thought to be our most unconscious filters. If you remember back to the communication model, we saw how the information that we take in is filtered through distortion, deletion and generalization. And one of the ways that we learn to filter is through our metaprograms. Carl Jung thought that he could predict which of 16 personality types a person was simply by knowing four of the most basic metaprograms. Depending on where someone was on the scale from introvert to extrovert, from sensor to intuitor, from thinker to feeler, and judger to perceiver. From these four, more complex metaprograms have been identified, and these are the ones that we're going to consider. So metaprograms are one of the internal programs or filters that we unconsciously use to decide what we're going to pay attention to and what we're going to consequently be interested in. Our metaprograms are not static and will change over time from context to context. So I've known someone who filters one way at work and a different way when they get home. So metaprograms can be affected by the state of the individual, the context in which they're currently operating, and the level of stress they perceive that they're experiencing. If you know someone's metaprograms, then that can help you predict his or her behaviour. But there is no right or wrong metaprogram, we're just different. In coaching, then you may find that in a particular situation that your client is in, there may be some patterns that will be more resourceful for them than others. It's important to make the distinction here between identity and behaviour. People are not their behaviours, they do their behaviours. So it's not useful to go around labelling people as a certain pattern, as though they only ever filter through that pattern. People will filter through all the patterns at times, but they may have preferences which will help to predict their behaviour and help you become flexible with your language and to create greater rapport and to help your client or someone else change in certain situations so that they can get better results. Shelley Rose Javet divides metaprograms into two categories motivation metaprograms and working metaprograms. And in the rest of this session, we're going to examine the motivation metaprograms. We're going to look at each program and how you would identify the program. Think about what type of behaviour you might expect from someone using that program. And how you would language things to them to stay in rapport and help them understand more fully. So we're going to consider five motivation metaprograms. These are to do with motivation level, the direction of the motivation, the source that the motivation comes from, the reason for the motivation and lastly the decision factors. The first one is about motivation and level. All the other metaprograms have questions that you can ask in order to identify them, but with this one the easiest way to identify it is to watch and notice if the person takes the initiative or do they wait for others to initiate things before they join in? So this pattern is about 
where the person fits on the scale from proactive to reactive. So proactive people will tend to take the initiative. They'll act without thinking or analysing, jump into situations. You may find that they're a bit impatient and sometimes they'll step on other people's toes and it's important to them to get things done. You'll recognise them from the short sentences that they use, the crisp and clear sentence structure and because they are direct and tend to have lots of movement and will easily show signs of impatience. If you want to influence and create rapport with a proactive person, then you'll want to use language like, just go for it, just do it, let's jump in and get on with it, why wait, do it now, right away, get it done, take the initiative, take charge, run away with it, let's hurry. People with a preference for being reactive, on the other hand, will wait for others to take the initiative. They may think and analyse things a lot, and perhaps without taking action. They'll tend to reflect on things and be patient and cautious. You can recognise the pattern by the fact that they will often use incomplete sentences and the frequent use of passive verbs and sometimes very long and convoluted sentences. They will talk about thinking about something or analysing a situation or understanding something and will probably use conditionals such as would, could, might and may. Influencing language to use with a reactive person is sentences such as well let's think about it. Now you've analysed it. This will tell you why. Consider this. Think about your response. You could, and then whatever it is you think they could do. What do you think is the impact of a very proactive coach using proactive language with a reactive client? What reaction are they likely to get? And what happens if you have it the other way round, where you have a reactive coach who is using reactive language with a proactive client? It highlights how important being flexible with your language is when you're a coach. The next meta program is about motivation direction. It's about whether people move towards goals that they want to achieve or away from things that they want to avoid. There are two questions that will help you identify which of these someone veers towards. Firstly you ask them what do you want in a job? And then whatever answer they give you, you then ask them why whatever their answer was to the last question is important to them. If they are towards, they will tell you about the things that they want. For example, when you ask them what do you want in a job, they may say autonomy. And when you ask them why that's important to them, they may say something like because I want to be able to use my creativity and experience. On the other hand, someone with an away from pattern will say it's important to them because they don't want to have to have someone continuously looking over their shoulder. So they have told you about what they don't want. So people with a toward pattern talk about what they gain, achieve, get, have, etc. and the goals that they want to achieve. They are very much motivated by goals and may have trouble in recognising problems. It's all about getting the goal. If you are wanting to influence a person with this pattern, you'll want to use words like attain, obtain, have, get, include, achieve, enable you to, benefits, the advantages, here's what you would accomplish. That sort of language is really useful in influencing them. On the other hand, a person with an away from pattern will talk about what they want to avoid, about 
problems and about what they don't want to have happen. They will be motivated by problems and the thought of solving them. They'll be energised by threats and will drop everything to fix something as they love sorting out problems. Language to use with this pattern is, well you won't have to do whatever it is, or it'll solve this problem, it'll prevent so and so happening, avoid, fix, prevent, not have to deal with, get rid of, it's not perfect. And that's the sort of language to use with someone with an away from pattern. Both of these patterns will motivate a person, it's just that they're motivated by different things. What would you think would happen to an away from person if a towards person started talking to them using towards language and talking about the goals that they have to achieve and what they can get from the goals? The away from person will probably be saying or thinking, well, it's all very well them setting these goals and targets, but they haven't thought about this problem and they haven't thought about how we're going to stop the same thing happening as the last time we had to go at this. Because for them, it's important to avoid all the things that they don't want to have happen. What about the other way around then? If you have an away from person using away from language with a towards person, what goes on with the towards person? Well, they will probably be thinking something along the lines of, all they ever talk about is problems. Why can't we just decide what it is we want to achieve and then set that as our goal? So with people with a towards pattern, it's about talking about goals. And with people with an away from pattern, you'll want to start with the current problems and then talk to them about how we can avoid them in the future. Write down how you would ask a towards person to take on a new responsibility. And then how you would change the way you asked an away from person to do exactly the same thing. Now we're coming on to patterns to do with motivation source. Um, this pattern is about where a person gets their motivation from. Is it from inside of themselves or is it from outside of themselves? So the question you want to ask is, how do you know when you've done a good job? People who are internally referenced will answer this something like, well, I just know to that question. They take information from the outside and then decide about it based on their own internal set of standards. They decide about the quality of their work. They may have um, difficulty in accepting other people's opinions and will take outside instructions just as information. So if you want to influence a person who is using this pattern, you'll want to say things like, well, only you can decide, or you might consider, or it's up to you. I suggest you think about it. Try it out and decide what you think. Here's some information so you can decide. What do you think? That's the sort of language you'd want to use with someone who is internally referenced. When you ask a person who is externally referenced, how do you know when you've done a good job? They will say something like, because my boss tells me, or because I look at the figures and they'll tell me I'm doing well. So other people or external sources decide for them. They have a need to compare their work with the norm or with a standard. And for them, outside instructions are taken as an order. They need other people's opinions feedback from external sources to stay motivated. They need to know how well they're doing and they're motivated when someone else decides. So if you want to influence someone who is externally referenced then you'll want to use phrases like you'll get good feedback or others will notice what you're doing or 
it's been approved by well respected you'll make quite an impact so and so thinks and then whatever it is that they think I would strongly recommend and the experts say so it's all that sort of language that you'd want to use with an externally referenced person what do you think will happen to an externally referenced person if they have an internally referenced manager who is using internally referenced language at them. Well, you'll probably hear the externally referenced person complaining that their boss never appreciates what they do or never gives them praise. What about the other way around? If someone is giving an internally referenced person lots of praise and feedback, well, they're likely to say something like, they're only just saying that, they don't mean it. Or, I know what I did was all right, whatever they say. Or, I know I didn't do that well, whatever they say. So internally and externally referenced people have a very different way of handling feedback. Write down how you would ask an externally referenced person to take on a new responsibility. And then write down how you would change the way you asked an internally referenced person to do the same thing. Now we're going to look at the motivation reason pattern. This pattern is related to the reason for the motivation. Is the person motivated by possibility or necessity? The question to discover this pattern is, why did you choose your present job or car or holiday or something? If the person replies by giving you a list of criteria, for example, they say something like, I chose it because it was well paid, involved working in a team and meant I had a great deal of autonomy, then they are motivated by having options. If they say something like, well, I didn't choose it. I had to have a job and that was it. Or their answer is a story of how they took on the job. They may answer the question by saying something like, well, I looked in the paper and noticed the job and thought I'd like it, so I went online and sent my CV. So they answer the question by giving you facts and events leading them to getting the job or a story about how they got it. In that instance, then, they are motivated by procedures. People with an options preference will be motivated by opportunities, possibility and choice. They think there is always a better way to do things and like, and like breaking or bending the rules. They like starting things and are not so fond of finishing them. Language is very important with these patterns. I have a preference for options and if anyone tells me I have to or got to or must do something it's like a red rag to a bull because choice is so important to me. So you want to use language like maybe, possible, opportunity, choice, break the rules just for you, another better way, unlimited possibilities, an alternative is here are the options and there's got to be a way. That's the sort of language you'd want to use with someone with an options preference. On the other hand, with someone with a preference for procedures, they believe that there is a right way to do things. And once they have a procedure, they can follow it time and time again. They tend to be interested in how to do things, not why. So in influencing language, you'll want to include words like must, have to, got to. Saying something like, first you must do this and next you have to do that, will suit this preference, as well as language like the right way and speaking in procedures. So first and then and after which, and the last step is, and it's tried and trusted, trusted method, it's reliable, the procedure is, it's a proven methodology. That's the sort of language that will influence them. What 
would you think is the impact on a procedures person if someone uses options languages around them? That's right, they just get frustrated and they just want the person to tell them what they have to do. And sometimes they get overwhelmed by the choices that they have. What about the other way around? If someone with an options preference has someone using procedures language at them, well, they may get frustrated and even stubborn because their, cho their choices have been closed down to them. It's very interesting to observe what happens in organisations when new procedures are introduced. And it's often a great time to identify the preferences. Write down how you would ask an options person to take on a new responsibility and how you would change it if you asked a procedures person to do the same thing. The last of the motivation patterns is motivation decision factors. This is to do with whether someone filters for things that are the same as they're used to or whether they filter for things that are different. So someone with a sameness preference will walk into a room and pay attention to things that are the same as things they're familiar with. They may say things like, Oh, that table is just like the one in my office. Or, Mary looks just like my cousin. Whereas someone with a preference for difference would walk into the same room and pay attention to all the things that are different. They might say things like, That wallpaper is very unusual. I've never seen anything like that before. Or, I do love your coat. That's very different. In identifying this pattern, you ask the questions, what is the relationship between your work this year and your work last year? Or, what is the relationship between your, this job and your last job? If they tell you that the two things are much the same, they have a sameness preference. And if they tell you about all the things that have changed, they will have a difference preference. So, if you're helping a person with a sameness preference to adopt a change, you'll want to emphasise all the things that will stay the same and use language as, this is the same as we used to do, or in common with, as you always do, like before, unchanged, as you already know. We're maintaining the same thing, totally the same, exactly as before. So with bringing in change with the sameness person, you want to talk about all the things that are going to stay the same. If you're helping a person with a difference preference change, then you'll want to tell them about how it's all going to change and use language like new, totally different, unlike anything else, unique, one of a kind, completely changed, unrecognisable, shift, switch, brand new, unheard of. The only one. That's the type of language that they like to hear. I'm sure you can already imagine what happens if you use difference language with a sameness preference. They feel uncomfortable and may well complain about how everything is always changing. And the other way around? Someone with a difference preference who is being talked to in a sameness way? Well, they're likely to get very bored and fed up and look for something new. Write down how you would ask a sameness person to take on a new responsibility and how you would change the way you asked them if they were a different person who you wanted to ask to take on a new responsibility. Here's an exercise to help you gain behavioural flexibility by using influencing language based on metaprograms. First of all, work with a partner and use questions to discover their current motivation programs in operation. Secondly, write an email to someone who is proactive towards and external about a change you want to implement, using influencing language appropriate to those metaprograms. Then write an email to someone about the same change who is away from procedures and sameness 
using influencing language appropriate to those metaprograms. Thirdly, write down how would finding out about someone's motivation programs help you in coaching. Here are some example answers to question three. It helps you use the most influencing language with the person. If you can listen carefully to your client and pick up on the meta programs, then you can change your language to suit their meta programs and so create deeper rapport and help them change more easily. It helps the client understand the implications in their relationships. Sometimes it's useful to make a client aware of the dynamics that are happening in a relationship as a result of meta programs. It can also be the cause of the problem. For example, a person may be feeling uncomfortable about doing something new because they have an external motivation source and there is no one telling them that they're doing a really great job and they're not easily able to evaluate their own performance. So meta programs are very useful in coaching and they're also useful in modelling and we'll have a look at that in the next session.